The new Hulu show Woke centers around a black cartoonist in San Francisco just about to hit mainstream success when his life changes. We are now joined by Keith Knight, the creator of Woke and the inspiration for the main character, Keith, with an F. Keith, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And you lived in San Francisco for 17 years working as a cartoonist. Why did you want to turn your life experiences into a show? Uh, it pays better. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I just had the opportunity to, uh, one of the reasons why I moved out to California all those years ago, uh, I came out to San Francisco in 1990. My goal was to be in San Francisco for five years and then move down to L.A. and try to develop something for television. And I loved San Francisco so much, I stayed there for 17. <laughs> and, um, it wasn't till my industry was imploding. Um, I, I had made my name in the alternative weekly market, uh, and but the Internet destroyed it. So I was just like, OK, now's the time to move down to Los Angeles and try to develop something for television. So that's, that's what happened. We moved down to LA and um, I lived there without a car for three years because I was, you know, typical San Franciscan. And, uh, but then once I got a car, I was able to understand that, you know, it's all about building relationships. I met the right people, the right producers who really dug my stories and dug my sensibility. And, and we went from there, started developing a television show. And then came all that money, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet, but no, no. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's humbling to, as a cartoonist, you, you spend so much time drawing by yourself. You know, it's, it's, what's great about the, the medium of cartooning is you just need a pen, you know, you need a, a, a marker or a pen and a piece of paper. So it's like, it's like a dollar. And then you can create anything you want. You can create spaceships, you can create uh, creatures, stuff going on in your in your stomach or whatever, anything. And it's always going to be the same budget. You try to translate that to television or film. <laughs> you know, it's all about like, do we have the special effects? Uh, how many actors do we need in a COVID time? Like, how can we, I mean, they're, they're creating CGI backgrounds uh, of people because they, they, they're not getting enough people for COVID. So it was really amazing to sort of go from working by yourself to working with hundreds of people and bringing these characters to life that started out as these little drawings. Yeah. And on a serious note, Keith getting racially profiled by police is what ignites the plot of the show. What was that? Don't move. Central, we have the suspect in question. What? Six foot tall. But you got the wrong guy. Copy that. It says in the suspect, Keith Knight. What was that real life experience like and how close was it to what happened on the show? It's definitely a lot more dramatized in the show. It wasn't in a big public space. It was um, actually uh, in the inner Richmond. It was right at the, the opening, the, the, the gate of Golden Gate Park uh, at Arguello and Fulton. And I was, I was putting up flyers for my band and uh, I was approached by, you know, a cop car pulled up and the guy jumped out and said, what are you doing? And um, I said, I'm hanging up posters. I have a stapler, let me put it down. Um, but when he got on the radio and said, we have the suspect and said, you know, it was a six foot tall black male and that was it. That gives police the right to stop just about anybody. So seeing all these cop cars come from Arguello and from Fulton up, up, up towards USF and down from the beach, I was just like, wow, this is, this is happening. This is the thing that I've been doing comics about. But the biggest surprise was when my my white roommate got off the bus across the street and came running at the police screaming like crazy, going nuts. And that was, that to me was the most traumatizing thing was watching how the police treated him like he was, he was their boss, you know, their manager. And the difference between how I get treated and people like me who look like me get treated and, and how he was treated. That was the, that was the, big moment for me that was like whoa this is really this is insane I, I it's it's one thing to do comics about it but to see it in action is scary and hopeless and 
bizarre at the same time when people try to argue, oh, no, if you just follow follow orders, everything will be okay. And I, I know if something happened to me in that incident, you know, the media would label me. I was part of, I was in a rap group. Um, they would have concentrated on the substances I might have been <laughs> on. And they would have just thought of every bad thing about me uh, and just, just made me look bad and, and, you know, said the cops were justified in doing whatever. And that's, that's an issue. That's systemic. That needs to change. And in the show, Keith doesn't suddenly gain all the answers overnight. He's still figuring things out as the season goes along. And that seems to be a lot more relatable to what real people go through, but is rarely translated onto the screen. Was that an important aspect to Keith's character you wanted to develop as well? It was super important. I, I always would tell people on set, like, Basically, my character is the Charlie Brown of activism. So he, he's trying to do the right thing, but he's stumbling <laughs> through it all. He's not, it's not quite working the way he wants it to work. And I just think that, like, I don't think there's, I think we all, when we become whatever, a change, it's not like just boom, all of a sudden I'm Superman. I, I'm ready to do whatever I need to do. It's a gradual change and that was important for us to to do this over the course of the eight episodes to um have you know some slight wins here and there but mostly losses makes those wins much better was there a specific yeah. moment when your perspective changed or you felt like you started to figure out the world like keith does in the show i'll tell you i mean one of the biggest moments and i talk about this a lot um was when I was a junior in college, I had my first black teacher and he was an American literature teacher. And he assigned us Maya Angelou and Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison and James Baldwin. And when someone asked him, why are you giving us all black writers? He said, I'm giving you all American writers. And that was a mind blower right there. Uh, that was because we're, we're taught so much that, you know, American literature, Mark Twain. And it, I realized that uh, I wasn't getting the, the education that I should be getting. And I think America doesn't get the education it should be getting. I think it, it gets this thing that uplifts, you know, European culture. It, it, it tells us that white people have done everything and and nobody else has done anything. And the reason why we're black people or uh, uh, people who are doing badly in this country are, it's, it's, they're not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. And see, we never got any bootstraps to pull ourselves up from. So uh, with, so uh, my, what I do, I do these slideshows around the country using my comics and humor and storytelling to inform people about America's racial illiteracy, because we learn, you know, about Christopher Columbus, we learn about the pilgrims. It's these fairy tales that are, in reality, are horrible stories, but we, we learn these happy things and that America can do no wrong. Now, we are seeing with this election these past four years, these past actually 12 years, the way people reacted to the first black president and how it brought out sort of the worst of America. We're learning stuff that we should have learned a long time ago, um, that this stuff is, is, has always been there and it's just sitting under the surface and it's bubbling up now. And hopefully we can move forward with the acknowledgement that this does exist and we need to change as a country and we need to learn from it and improve. And you said earlier your shock wasn't getting racially profiled, but your white roommate's reaction to how he was treated by police. Why was that more of a shocker to you? Well, the, the, fa the fact that he felt completely comfortable getting up in their faces and screaming bloody hell <laughs> at them and feel like nothing was going to happen to them because <laughs> you know we're taught that you know you gotta 
you have to be polite. You have to, you know, you have to make sure you don't give them any reason, any reason. And, you know, I grew up in Boston and, um, you know, we have a lot of sports championships to celebrate. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen again, <laughs> but, um, but there were a lot of, a lot of white people acting the fool and I've never seen police and they have reasons to do things and they've never done anything to, to, so I, you can't tell me that like police can't hold back and, and understand, you know, they're holding back all the time. It just depends on what the crowd is. It's a, it's a black lives matter crowd. Let's start shooting gas stuff and start beating people. But if it's, you know, if it's a, let's kidnap the Michigan governor thing, then everyone's really polite. And your encounter with police, of course, is at the center of the show. But there's also a lot of, a lot of focus on the microaggressions people of color have to deal with on a regular basis. How were you able to write those moments into the show? So you're Keith Knight? I am. It's funny, I didn't think you'd be tall. I, I think we could all write. I, I think you could write it. I think everyone could could write this stuff. Um, we just, you know, it was a, 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 a nice. It was a nice, diverse writers' room, and just people just throwing out all the different things that they've had to encounter and uh, and what they've experienced. I look like Sammy Sosa. Uh, Am I too black for my own comic strip? <laughs> oh, trust me. No one's gonna ever accuse you of being too black. I'm sorry, what? And it was just super important for us to get that in there because we've all experienced it. And it, if you did experience to you, you, then you've done it. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think the show resonates with people in good ways and bad ways. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I think that's me. <laughs> That's happened to me, too. Yeah. San Francisco has definitely changed since you last lived here years ago. But do you believe the city is as racially progressive and liberal as its reputation? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it, it's it's a it's a wonderful place. It's a magical place, but it can't it cannot overcome 400 years of systemic racism. So, you know, the police are still the police. The the gentrification issues are still the gentrification issues. The the pay scale, the I mean all this stuff, there's no way you can be some magical place that overcomes all this. The educational system, all of that is still in place. Now, I, I and I know San Francisco has changed, but it still has the magic. Last time I was there, I, 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 I just walked across town and just and fell into all this, all these crazy adventures the way I did when I lived there. You know, I left in 2007, but um, it's still a place where you can walk by, hear some music, go, oh, what's that? And then go in and find yourself in this amazing, <laughs> I don't know, store with some band going nuts and free beer <laughs> just it's uh it's still an amazing place i do agree with you that it is a magical place and we appreciate you for the magic you bring to the screen as well keith great talking to you thank you thank you i appreciate uh my time in the bay area um, absolutely virtually and in person yes sir thank you much